Hello to everyone at home. Thank you so much for being here. I'm with the filmmaker, director of 837 Rebirth. If you please introduce yourself. Hello everyone and thank you. My name is Juanita Peters. I am the director and contributing writer to 837 Rebirth. So, so happy that you are here with us because like I have a lot of thoughts, but we are actively hunt we're actively hunting for films from the Maritimes um, because there's obviously we know a dearth of uh, filmmakers when it comes to or when it comes to um, marginalized filmmakers making feature films in general across Canada. But in the Maritimes, we're like, oh, like we really want to program something from the Maritimes as well. And then like it'd be like like the the, the clouds had opened and then um, 837 rebirth, here it is. Uh, so <laughs> so thrilled. <laughs> Uh, that you're here with us. Um, I kind of just wanted to speak about or ask you firstly, uh, kind of about like the call to making the film or how kind of the production journey, like how you kind of were involved in the film, like how did you get started with making, uh, making the film? Well, the film um, itself, the story came from the original writer and producer Hank White. Uh, it was inspired uh, very loosely by uh, an event that happened uh, in his childhood where a storekeeper, an immigrant storekeeper was murdered by some young uh, neighborhood kids. And, um, and, and that kind of started that um, germ of, of that violence and someone coming and trying to have a good life in Canada. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the story over the years just sort of took a number of turns. So um, uh, Hank White and Joe LeClaire began writing it about five, six years ago, uh, and, uh, and it went through a number of drafts, and uh, the, the characters were always extremely strong, and the message was, was really, really strong, and, and that's what I became tied to, so they brought me in about five years ago, uh, mm -hmm. and then I did a, a final uh, shooting script. Uh, draft on it uh, and um, you know just trying to keep with those important themes and the important messaging uh, but um, give you a little bit of a thriller along the way. <laughs> hmm. and I think it's so interesting because a lot of uh, like there are the few that are just like not writers on the project specifically or starting to write with it. Um, you're one of the only films at Real World this year where the writer, the director did not write the film like originally and mm -hmm. you took it, you made your shooting script to kind of like give it your own spin um, and kind of like insert yourself as a creative in there. Uh, but I'm curious about kind of like when you were approached, like when, like what made you, what made you feel like, yeah, I can direct this. Like I like this, I'm the right one for the job. Um, what was it about the project where you're like, I can offer something of like, I can offer something really good here to this project? Well, both original writers, Joe and uh, Joe LeClaire and Hank White are, are friends of mine. And uh, we've been friends for, I would say the better part of almost 20 years. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, I've been a fan of a lot of their work. Uh, and uh, when they approached me, uh, and I read the content, I saw so many pieces that are, um, if you look at any of my other films, there's, there's a line, uh, that a, a thread that is through each and every one of them and every piece of work I've ever done. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it's, and it's in, it had the op opportunity to be in this piece as well, which is that piece around how very different we can all be and yet be the same. You know, we all need the same things. And um, we all require the same things and expect the same things of life. But, you know, depending on where we begin uh, or our circumstances, it can really change, you know, mm -hmm. those opportunities and outcomes. So. Hmm. Well, then, so then from, from there, when you talk about like being attached as director and like finding kind of a through line that like there's, I feel like it's interesting that you say that, um, you, the through line in your work is like people very different are can find something the same like similar um and then also like you saw that like you saw that in the work of hank white and uh joe Lecla joe or john leclerc 
Joe LeClaire. Joe LeClaire. I yeah. find it interesting that like, like the, the same through line that exists in your work, you were able to find through another piece. And so I guess I'm curious about um, when it comes to directing, um, I feel like asking you about your process is very broad, but when it comes to the touchy subject matter pertaining to mental health, because there is an aspect of like he is in utter turmoil uh, because of like the trauma of like that moment, what it meant for your protagonist. So I'm curious about what your approach was to the film in general and your approach to um, directing and like um, your conversation around mental health when you came to actually doing the work. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because um, I've had uh, the fortunate um, opportunity to have many conversations in that arena long before this film came to me. Um, there was an opportunity uh, uh, that I took about 10 years ago. I think it was 10 years ago, maybe it was, uh, anyway, a while back uh, where I had an opportunity to actually be in the room with uh, a number of freedom riders. And uh, mm -hmm. it was not planned, um, but the, the conference that I wound up attending was um, two freedom riders uh, in, on the panel and a sister to one of the freedom riders. And, one of the things that she uh, talked about, which was new to me, was the idea that um, you could block out pain, that you could block entirely block out pain, mm -hmm. which uh, over the years I've subsequently learned from uh, later uh, panels and uh, uh, that that is absolutely true, that there is no memory for pain and even in terms of, uh, so her brother was burned on the bus and suffered uh, major debilitating burns, mm. uh, but he blocked that out uh, in the memory of the incident even, he blocked it out until he was in his seventies. And mm -hmm. why it, he was able to talk about it in his seventies, he said that he felt that he wasn't afraid of it anymore. Ooh. So he could talk about it, but until, so the first thing for me came from the trauma um, and the fact that people could block things out. The other thing that really interested me about this story is memory. Mm. Um, and I've also learned that memory can be very tricky memory what we think we know and what we actually know might be two different things. And I know even myself, you know, if, if you had asked me as recently as eight years ago, I would have swore that I saw the movie Car Wash in Toronto with my grandfather in the theater. Uh, and I would have, I would have laid money on it. Mm -hmm. But recently a conversation came up about that movie and I looked it up. And just by the date alone, I know that wasn't possible. I, <laughs> I, I could not have seen it in the Toronto theater because me and my grandparents were no longer living in Toronto at that time. We were here in Nova Scotia. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, but again, you know, my memory, I did go to the theater a lot with my grandfather, but I did not go and see that movie right. with him in Toronto. It had to have been in Nova Scotia. Um, and, you know, I've uh, done uh, other, you know, uh, research pieces where memory was a factor uh, mm -hmm. and especially memory coupled with trauma. And um, as a child, you know, uh, even in a happy time, so forget the trauma, even mm -hmm. in a happy time, your memory isn't always as accurate as you think it is, you know, or you may be focused on one thing and somebody else is focused on something else. You may not have seen certain things. So those were pieces, the mind, memory, trauma. Uh, it was all very, very interesting to me and, um, and what that can do to you. Mm. Wow. I love like, I love like, thank you. Cause I feel like every now and then I ask a question, like, tell me about your process or how it started. And like, it, but like, I love like learning about the pieces of like, I got a little snippet from here and a little snippet from here and like managed to like impact um, your directorial choices. Uh, so I, I guess one of the other things that I really enjoyed about the film and we already spoke about it briefly is like the fact 
but it's set in the Maritimes. Um, <laughs> set in the East Coast. I just want to see content things from that region of Canada. It's so vivid. And, uh, and so I wanted to kind of ask, a, like kind of shift the, the, the conversation more to like the filmmaking process um, and like the filmmaking community in the Maritimes, because I feel like it's very easy to forget. And I don't say easy, uh, because obviously the Maritimes means a lot to Canada. However, I feel like a lot of the times us mainlanders might consider, like fail to consider the Maritimes, uh, which I think is not, not good. So I guess my question is kind of like, um, making what what was it like making what is it like making films in in the Maritimes was it extra special to you because you got to make a film where you live can you just speak kind of uh, to the filmmaking community and like uh and kind of speaks like what we might not know about the filmmaking community in the Maritimes because like well yeah yeah let me start with um if you were uh watching television in the 90s there were 11 national television series coming out of Atlantic Canada. Uh, so Street yeah. Sense, This Hour is 22 Minutes, uh, I could go on and on, uh, Lex the Dark Zone, uh, Black Harbor, um, uh, uh, tons. You know, there were so many television series coming out of Atlantic Canada and prime time series. So um, we actually, especially in the comedy uh, end of things, Atlantic Canada has been a leader there for some time. And also in the animation, you know, so Salter Street Films has been putting out, you know, children's programming for, I don't know, I want to say 30 years, uh, mm -hmm. a very long time. What happened in Atlantic Canada was the elimination of the tax credit uh, a few years ago. And uh, what happened there was a lot of people left. There was just no industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've started building it up. I said, when I first came to... Um, Nova Scotia in 1996 to live. Uh, I was working, uh, I think, 98 National Film Board of Canada. And the National Film Board Atlantic region was doing 32 films a year. Uh, okay. So they were a, a lot of product coming out of Atlantic Canada. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, now we're, uh, you know, getting uh, back up and running. The industry is growing again here. We're starting to attract some of the uh, native Nova Scotians and others to come back. And, you know, if you come here, there is work. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, in terms of creators, a lot of the creators come from Nova Scotia and move to other parts of Canada where the industry, Vancouver, Toronto, where industry is, is thriving uh, for sure. Um, so for me, um, all my filmmaking has been here in Atlantic Canada. Uh, my stories are, I think, universal, uh, but there's just something about, so these stories in terms of the people in place are, are not unique to Nova Scotia, but they're, they're told with an African Nova Scotian lens mm -hmm. or um, uh, an Atlantic native Mi'kmaq or Maliseet lens, mm -hmm. um, which actually would resonate, uh, I think, around the world. Uh, so yeah. Well, it's, it's, I was actually hoping to transition to that conversation because one of the protagonists is a Mi'kmaq person. And then also like, uh, we all, like a part of me feels like you have some kind of affiliation with the Africville Museum. Uh, yes, no? Oh, I am. I'm the executive director of the Africville okay, Museum. Right, that's what yeah. I was thinking. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. like, right, right, right. Um, like double checking my research before getting on <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> um, and so I guess my question kind of pertains to your inter the intersections of identity that are not centered around whiteness and how like you as a black woman, you as a person that is very aware of like the history of Africville in uh, in Nova Scotia, um, how that might have cha changed your approach, or how to not even change, like influence your approach to the filmmaking process and the content when you were working on this film. Uh, so, if you can speak to that, yeah, and I don't think it would have changed my process in any way, but my storytelling comes from I am uh, African Nova Scotian. I am seventh generation Nova Scotian. Uh, we've been here for four hundred years my family, uh, I'm also Maliseet and Mi'kmaq. And uh, as you may or may not know, uh, one of the things that happened culturally 
uh, with our native communities, especially uh, when people married outside of their um, uh, tribe, uh, is that especially women. So my uh, great great grandmother would ha have lost her status for uh, marrying, you know, outside of her culture. Mm -hmm. um, that is no longer the case, but it was. Uh, and we were often told to choose who we are. Right. Uh, and we are all those things. And so you can't put one ahead of the other. You can't, you know, so I try to respect all of me, not little pieces of me, but all of me. Mm -hmm. And um, I think um, uh, we're in an era where uh, people are, you know, searching hard for their genealogy and they're going online. Well, I don't even have to do that because mm -hmm. I have uh, all my uh, lineage uh, right back to the 1700s in the Bible. <laughs> it's all right there in my mother's Bible because, you know, again, we've been here a long time. Right. Uh, and so we're very fortunate to be able to tell those stories. And um, um, yeah. Wow. Like even like it's so because like, I was when we talk about settlerhood and then we also talk about like the idea of like who is Canadian, who should go home, that kind of idea, like those awful idea ideology when it comes to um people that xenophobia, that kind of that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. It's like we forget that like the person that's been here 400 years might not for 400 years, their family has been here for 400 years, might not look like what you'd expect. And like, that's one of my favorite things about the rich history uh, of like people that come from like uh, Nova Scotia is that it's like, it's not what you would expect, which is why I'm still so happy that this film is here. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your lineage and like how that, how your lineage does kind of impact your filmmaking. Um, my last couple of questions kind of pertain to masculinity. Um, so there is a lot of masculinity at play in the film um pretty much the, all the all of the people we like our ciphers to the story are are men and i was thinking i'm like when a woman does that it's intentional i was uh, maybe 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 so i was curious about if you were trying to make a commentary on masculinity or what your approach was to the concept of masculinity when you sat down to do the work of directing this film not at all. And uh, so the in, in this particular film, that is who the story is about. You know, these these two guys, you know, initially who think that they're so very different from each other. Um, right. And, you know, I don't want to give it all away, but uh, we learn some very important things, you know, in the in near the end of the film. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, is there some testosterone at play there? Absolutely. You know, we see it all in the, in the, you know, the, the, the boxing, you know, with the, uh, the, the, the two men and then the, the father and the son and, you know, and what does it mean to be tough and to be a man, you know, so, you know, math man is even in the power and the math, you know, the, right. and the, the, the action yeah, right. figures, yeah. it's all in there. Right. But at the, at the end of the day, really, it's a story about what we show and who we really are, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, we are showing one outside self when inside we're really feeling, you know, uh, very much at risk or afraid. Mm -hmm. And um, and sometimes fear comes out, you know, in, in that way, um, yeah. Well, I guess like this is you've led me to my last question. I'm not sure if you uh, kind of read my notes before coming here, <laughs> um, but like I guess I kind of and I think you've kind of answered it. But if you wanted to be a little bit more succinct about it, you're more than welcome to be. Um, I always ask this of filmmakers, where it's like, what were you hoping to say with the film, or what did you want to leave your audiences with, um, and how is that like? It's it's a large question, but like, what were you hoping to say? What did you want to leave audiences with and like did what you did that change like the idea the ideas of like what the story was about and what you wanted to offer audiences or offer the viewer when you started the film did that change by the time that you finished it did it change now absolutely <laughs> yeah it did you know in 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 various ways and and uh in 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 actually very impactful ways um I think the story still says the same thing, but how we say it is very different. Mm -hmm. um, in that, you know, life is complicated. 
life is very complicated. And sometimes uh, right and wrong are not black and white. Uh, and sometimes uh, we all can have contributed to the outcome of something. Uh, mm-hmm. And in this case, it, it was a domino effect, right? right? If each person had made, if each person or even one person had made, it's actually a triangle. It's not two people, uh, which you'll later see. <laughs> um, if even one person had made a different choice, the outcome mm-hmm. would have been different. And mm-hmm. life is kind of like that, but we just never know. You know, at the time, hindsight, they say, is 50-50. And mm-hmm. it's absolutely true. Uh, but, you know, life is messy. And, um, you know, we should just think yeah (laughs) harder before we (laughs) make any you know that's what I love about the the message you know of um glues cap is you know to to think Mm -hmm. think before you move Mm -hmm. think before you act and um uh and you'll see that in the in the painting in the uh, description of of who glues cap was and what the message was and why glues cap was not giving power to move until he had seen enough on the earth, until he had seen uh, um, the the earth and the sky and all the living things. And he could understand how whatever he did affected all the things on the earth. And so, you know, for me, there's a lot of poetry in there, right? Ooh, honey. Yeah. And like, it's just, <laughs> I think this is the power of film where it's like, you say it's like, it's there's a universality to it when it talks, like, especially in the climate that we're talking, I say climate, yeah. uh, which is like, well, I was kind of thinking about like our climate emergency right now, but like mm-hmm. how this film has nothing to do with climate change. And even as you say that there's like certain universalities we can take and it's yes. like thinking before we act. And like, if we can just, if, if one person had just did one different thing or acted differently, then like, things might not be this like the way they are or might have not panned out the way they did and I just I I find I'm find myself very struck by that concept so thank you so much for um taking the time to chat with me and for um being brave enough to make a film (laughs) it's hard um you're a star thank you so much uh and I really hope to audiences that you get a chance to watch 837 Rebirth as you'll be very 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 uh, you'll have a great time watching it as I thank you thank you so much yeah thank you Juanita